Check one, check one, two, three. Hey everybody, it's Michael Helms, also known as Michael the Sound Guy, and this is the Location Sound Podcast. You know, each episode we talk with location sound mixers, boom ops, and other industry pros about the various aspects of recording sound on location, whether it's for feature and independent films, TV commercials, interviews, any time where dialogue from actors is recorded. I started my career in the recording studios in New York City with some of the big artists back in the day, and later on projects for networks like HBO, Sci-Fi Channel, and the Cartoon Network. As time went by, I got out of the studio and began working in production sound. Whether you're a seasoned veteran or just starting out, thanks for joining us. My guest today is owner of Wild Style Media Group. He produces high-quality digital media, including The Messengers, a podcast documentary, which is now on Amazon. So please welcome Neil Gilliarte. Hey, hey, hey. So Neil, welcome. Thanks for having me. Yes, sir. Now, Neil and I originally met at PodFest in Tampa, Florida, a number of years ago, and he and I then reconnected again at Podcast Multimedia Expo in Orlando, and then we ran into each other out at NAB in Las Vegas, and so we said, you know, we need to sit down and and do an interview. So here we are today. Yes, we finally did it. You are a director and producer, but you're still in the trenches, and you still don't mind getting your hands dirty. Yeah, yeah. But you, you still edit, you still get out there and shoot. Do you have a philosophy on just staying hands-on? Well, a, a little bit of it's uh, just the nature of going from being a one-man band for so long and then slowly growing the business. You know, we have a couple of audio engineers and editors now that are handling a lot of our audio posts. But, you know, I'm still out there. I still love producing, shooting. Um, I love editing. But slowly as the company grows, I, I, I'm trying to peel away and be a little bit more 30,000 feet. But... There's just still a big part of wanting to have a little control over more of the system, as, as I say, like the ingestion, getting it in the box. I shot it. I know what I shot. I know. So I edit quicker. But we are growing, um, thankfully, and that's changing my role. But that is sort of why it's just been sort of the metamorphosis of growing the business. Now, we mentioned the Messengers podcast documentary that you directed and edited with executive producer Chris Kremitzos. So tell us a little bit about that project. Sure. Well, that was born at PodFest. We were literally sitting there. Chris was listening to some of the amazing stories, people like Glenn the Geek from the Horse Radio Network. They were just telling their stories of how they became podcasters. And he leaned over and he just said, listen, if we were to bottle these stories up, follow them around all the different places they live, you think we'd have a movie. And that was sort of the genesis of it. Uh, We ended up doing a crowdfunding campaign, uh, raised about 110% of our goal, and literally started a 10-month trek chasing everybody around the globe. We went to Guatemala, Puerto Rico, a bunch of different states. Really fun. We were able to meet some of the top podcasters, but also beginners. And we ended up making that movie, and we've been really blessed. It's on Amazon. It's on iTunes, Amazon Prime. Uh, It's called The Messengers, a podcast documentary. And uh, it's really, really good. I I would really encourage everybody that's a podcaster to see it. Now, when you're, uh, you know, working on an international project like that, it comes with a lot of challenges on its own. But regarding recording the sound for the documentary, what were some of the issues that you faced? (laughs) <laughs> I don't think this show is long enough for the issues. Um, but you're right. You know, it was a challenge. And let me be honest, you know, we were trying to do this on as small of a budget as possible. Right. So this film was intentionally shot on DSLR and trying to be extremely mobile. We only had a small crew of two to three at times, uh, meaning uh, two shooters and an audio person uh, and Chris. So many times it was just me, Chris or me and one other person. So we never had a dedicated audio guy. We ended up relying on the Rode Wireless Filmmaker Kit, which I just can't speak highly enough in the sense of it's been dropped. It's been dropped down a mountainside, kicked, you know, stepped on by a horse, thing still works. And then we were recording at the time into a Tascam DR, I think it was 60D, the small one, the you know, the, the one that can hang around your neck. Um, it's, it's what I had at the time for DSLR recording. And, um, that worked out really well. We also uh, did employ when able a, um, I bought a, uh, a Rode, I think it's an NTG four plus because it's 
it has an internal battery. So it, when you're going so remote, there is nowhere to always plug in. So the fact that you could plug it in USB, power it and get a ton of time off of it. It, those two were basically the tools for that film. And it sounds really good. A lot of that was uh, post-production as well. Um, we had tons of challenges. Your question was challenges was sort of background noises, uh, fountains in the back, birds on the mountainside, cars going by, constantly shooting outside. And then when we were indoors, like in Puerto Rico, which only Duma is, it was Echo. He had a beautiful house with marble everywhere, marble this, marble that. And the sound was just reflecting off of everything. So just different challenges like that. But thank God for our audio engineer, <laughs> Ralph Lugo, who... Um, ended up getting Isotope RX and really putting it to work. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah, that's always a challenge. It's like we, you know, we shoot or we're shooting in some people's homes. They've got, yeah, they've got the tile floor, high ceilings, and not a lot of carpet anywhere. And, you know, we're always bringing in sound blankets and throwing them down on the floor and then hanging them up just off camera so you can't see them and anything. Mm -hmm. And actually, recently we were doing a one and we actually had like a four by four floppy that we had just to help with the lighting. But it actually made a nice little cover over our actor, which really helped with the with the reverb in the room as well. So yeah, we could have really used some flags out there at least anything. But uh, honestly, we were true documentary shooting sometimes on the side of a mountain in Guatemala, by the ocean in Puerto Rico. Uh, I also went to Haiti for some for another project that same exact setup and challenges there. But I got to really give it to the people that rode for that particular wireless kit. I can't speak for every other microphone they have on the world, but just employing that as one of our primary audio devices it sounded so warm it sounded really good so in other words you know good in good out but the issue we had wasn't great audio it was background noise that was our biggest trouble okay here you were on location shooting all the stuff but then you came back and then you actually edited it so in post-production what were some of the techniques you used when you were treating the audio well, what I did to try to save time was, and I don't normally do this. I normally cut and then I send them what I actually used, right? Like clean what we used, not clean everything. But because we were shooting and it was going to be every other weekend and I never knew when I was going to go again, I literally started dropping Ralph the files in their entirety. So he had to clean 35 minute interviews, even if I used a two minute portion of it. And you know how it is, right? There's noise at the beginning, then it goes away, then there's another noise, then the plane went by. So he ended up having to dice the audio in parts and really treat them individually. And then what I did was sync everything in um, pluralized because I didn't have the, I, I could have synced manually, but then I'd have to find only what I use. So I just said to screw it, we're going <laughs> to, we're going to basically sync everything in pluralize. And then I edited from there. But that was just for time savings uh, and and budget restraint. It's not the way I'd do it right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know? um, so, yeah. But that, it, again, the messengers was a labor of love and it was a can we do it? You know, so we were we did buy pluralized. We did buy Isotope RX and the mics just for the project. But it you're hearing it's a very low amount of audio gear. It's not a ton, you know. Yeah. Now, now, were you connected to the camera at all when recording or just to the little? No, to no. The I was going into the, the Tascam digital recorder because I wanted it separate. What that did allow, though, to help me a little bit was the, the camera had the NAT audio and it helped me sync whenever we did have drift, whenever we did have problems. Um, I was able to sync up by using the NAT audio. But I really wanted external sound because I wanted that choice. Okay. You know? Yeah, great. And your experience with Pluralize has been pretty good? You know, it's, it's very easy to use, um, but it's also easy to turn it into a crutch. Mm. You know, it does allow you, in this particular film, we use Final Cut Pro 10. So it does allow you to export that sync into your timeline, you know, and it does a lot of pretty work for you. What ends up happening, though, you end up relying on it too much. Um, and I think what that allows for is not paying as close of attention as if you were doing it the harder way, right? Because when you do things the harder way, it might take a little longer, but you're being more careful because it's harder. So you don't want to do it again. Exactly. Right? Um, you know, Pluralize not only syncs, it also allows you to re-export that clip pre-synced. So it makes another new clip with the synced audio. Well, I mean, that could spoil you. Yeah. But, you know, we were often editing on laptops, though, as well in the field, and they weren't as powerful as when we got back to the IMAX or whatever. So... It it was awesome. I still use it very much, um, but I am a, sometimes a glutton for punishment. I still like to sync manually sometimes. Mm -hmm. I still like to just look at it and 
do it the hard way. It's a little part of probably been editing since 91. And sometimes I just <laughs> fight automation for some reason, even though it helps me. Yeah. And, de- and depends <laughs> on how much audio you're syncing. Right. And, right, and right. if you want to do it all manually. So that's true. Sometimes you're just good at it. Like I feel like I, you know, I can drop an audio file, sync it really fast, you know, and the time that I'm going to click on pluralize to do stuff, I could have already finished it. That's just me. But I am trying and every project I'm automating more and more. <laughs> that's true. Now, when you're farther away from your actor, did you ever have any sync issues? Because the camera's picking yeah. up, you know, that sound and then you're so any issues with that? Yeah, absolutely. And so when that happened, we basically just had to, you know, really eyeball it. Um, okay. But we were lucky that we had at all times two cameras when most of the time, 90% of the time we had two cameras and we would always put one on an extreme close up. And that would allow us to use a nap from that camera. Okay. Now, yeah. now, when you're doing these projects, do you prefer to buy your own gear or do you rent? Which one do you prefer? I bought it because I knew we were going to, you know, I knew we were going to probably damage it. We were going to be going to other countries, going to other places. My fear was to damage rented gear and have to pay the rental plus the property. Right. right? So in this case, now what was funny was we bought this mic for a couple of hundred dollars, the wireless, and then it got stolen in Haiti. Oh no! So we ended up having to buy it twice. So I probably could have been a rental at that point. <laughs> oh my but I choose to buy it like any gearhead um, when possible. Been blessed now. Uh, that the film did well, we've grown. I, I talked to you like NAB, that companies are starting to like help us along in a sense of wanting their product to use on the project. So it's allowing us to have more, more choices. And so now I don't have to purchase as much. Some of the stuff that we're lucky to be using right now, it's some, some of the companies want us to want us to put their equipment to work and, and maximize it and see how it performs. So it's been a blessing to kind of have some additional tools. I don't rent much. Um, Lenses tend to be what I rent the most. Okay. Now, when you're working on a project, what do you expect from your from your audio team? Okay, I'm going to sound mean, but I don't mean to because I've been every job. I've been an audio guy, been a video guy. I expect them to care a ton Um, because I've worked with so many people that treat audio as the bastard child, like just just record it, just get it. It sounds good enough. We can fix it in post. I'm, I'm a passionate filmmaker, I'm a passionate shooter. I care a lot when I'm shooting. I want it to look, I don't fix in post. That's not in my mind. I will, but it's not ever in my mind. I shoot like this is the one and only Holy Grail chance I'm going to get. Um, I was just in North Dakota shooting a documentary with Nakota Horses, and I acted like I would never, ever come back when I was shooting. And when I work with sound people, I've been lucky enough to have one or two in my career that they just love audio. They don't just do it. They love it. And they want to they wanna hand me a high quality file, you know? So what I expect is excellence, you know, I expect them to love their craft. I don't want someone that does sound because they couldn't decide what career they want. I want to work with people that want to give me the ultimate sound quality. I want them to know when to change mics. I want them to identify weaknesses. I mean, I don't want to have to ask, do we need to put a dead cat on this thing? The minute they hear uh, Wynn Russell, I want them to switch. You know, I want someone to... They're driving and I'm trusting, but it's really hard to find. And I'm not, I'm not trying to bash any of today's younger guys, but it feels like the craft of audio is really kind of getting lost out there. And I'm, I'm always encouraging and trying to mentor audio guys to really go above and beyond. I know it's a long answer, but that's, it's a passionate thing. And audio is so important. It's so important, almost more important than the visual. That's true. Yeah. We, we, I was talking with uh, Luke Pearson. Uh, He is a, uh, sound mixer recorder out of Kentucky, but we got mm-hmm. on the discussion about you know some sets they don't you know they don't want audio talking to anybody they just just record the audio but then you have yeah. you know, especially smaller independent films you get a little more of a relationship going and we're all part of the process and we're all trying to do the best job possible. Yeah, it is one giant symbiotic relationship. I want the audio guy telling me to stop because something's wrong. I don't want him to wait till I'm miles down the road. To then tell me, can we do it again? You know, so it just depends. Everybody's different. I've been doing this since 1991, gotten to work on major projects to real little projects. I've done projects where just not having the best audio killed the entire project. Everything else is amazing. And the audio sounds flat. They don't, they're not happy. People expect what they see on TV and film, sadly, out of the little guy. 
So if you're going to bother to do video, film, TV, or even audio, I just really, I, I really implore people, master the craft. Don't just do the job. Great advice. Yeah. So what was the most interesting project you've ever done? Hmm. <laughs> well, I've been doing this for 27 years. That's a loaded question. But um, most interesting, I mean, I worked homicide video for a long time. That was interesting. Mm. But as far as like being my own company, being my own producer, uh, filmmaker, The Messengers was the most challenging long-term project. It had tons of variables with a small crew. What I just did this past weekend was highly, highly challenging, almost up there with the messengers. Uh, never been out in the open, you know, recording, not just visuals, but also being the only guy I was doing the audio as well uh, and the drone. So being out in the middle of nowhere in North Dakota, you know, recording horses, recording equipment, it was really challenging. But the messengers was a uh, constant change. I never could trust or make a template of anything. So it was highly customized. And for that reason, I think the most challenging. What was your worst on set experience? <laughs> on what the messengers or just that? Just, all? <laughs> just any video project you've worked on. And if it's audio related, that's even better. It's kind of a dual whammy. Uh, it does affect audio, but, um, Basically, I got hired, uh, you know, we all have the, oh, we're hiring a director from LA syndrome, right? So we're an East Coast team. And we were actually hired because a client wanted a director from LA. So they hired a Disney Channel star to direct a music video. And then they hired me to make sure he did his job. So it became tough because everything he wanted was wrong, technically, by my training, by my experiences. And so it was a constant uphill battle to get him to do it the right way so that we wouldn't be embarrassed at the end. And a lot of that included audio on set, playback of the music. Um, you know, he never wanted to do full performances. He wanted to play back just six seconds where it would be really tough to sync. And then when we did do uh, audio on set, he... You know, I don't know what school of audio he went to, but he'd want to like, you know, boom them from the bottom and, and and not get as close as we wanted. He wanted to be way further back and because, you know, he had his reasons, but it just made it. I felt like I was constantly battling a quote unquote younger, more inexperienced person, but that was my boss. So thinking of the client at the end that I have to face and say, I was there, I did my job because they're going to hold me accountable. Why did the sound sound bad? Why was playback slow? Why is video bad? Um, that was the worst experience ever just because they wanted to say they had a L.A. director. Okay. Now, we always try to be as prepared as possible on set, but have you ever gone to shoot and have forgotten something? Oh, every shoot. <laughs> uh, you know, especially when I was young and thinking I was the bomb and I wasn't, and I would forget key pieces of equipment, particularly batteries you know, having enough batteries and of every kind, you know, luckily today we have these battery banks that save our life. But back in the day, if you didn't have enough double A's or whatever, or C battery, whatever you carried, um, I was notorious for not having enough battery. I mean, of course, the, the predicament that puts you in is you can't shoot if you run out of batteries, right? But um, forgetting lights is another big one. You know, I've mm -hmm. forgotten, I brought lights, but forgot like dimmables or smaller ones or gels and those things put you in a real predicament um so i've kind of because i've been a one-man band for so long before now I, I was a master at using natural lighting um because i knew i'd forget stuff once in a while so i really got good at using natural elements and then that way i didn't have to rely on that stuff as much so even to this day i i use lighting as little as i need to i love to shoot with god's lighting it works great excellent now, <laughs> now, as uh, you know, talking with audio recorders and mixers, we always are making backups of the audio files. And I know you're backing up everything, video. And how long do you keep backups? I keep them. Um, okay. Real reason, uh, real answer is a long, long time. But uh, for the business, I kind of keep everything for about five years in a box. You know, we've had clients that come back two years later. Oh, my God, we had a fire. We lost this. Do you still have the sound or do you still have the video? So it saved a couple of people. I tend to keep things even longer than that just because it's just me not wanting to get rid of it's that fear that if I delete this, you know, <laughs> they're going to want it. But about five years, we do have a, a filing system and every fifth year we purge. Okay. Every fifth year. Yeah. So that's, that's a yeah. good, uh, cause we were discussing the other day is two years long enough and then contacting the client and saying, Hey, is it okay if I delete this? Okay. Well with that, it's different. See, like I'm keeping it out of courtesy because what I do when I get hired for gigs, I let them know that they need to provide me with a backup drive. When I give them their, 
their final, I don't just turn in the final video like a lot of people do. I give them the option for some additional cost that I will give them all the raw assets or I will give them the edited assets and key things that need to be backed up. Okay. Sound is always on there. And so then I eliminate that. They now have the hard drive. What I do is I burn things off the Blu-ray or I get them onto some other optical thing that's not as long-term. Um, because I'm not going to keep it for 25 years. Right. And then our, every fifth year, we go through this folder that has the script, all the disks, all the USBs, and then we just purge it, you know, and repurpose what we can repurpose. But yeah, I put it on them to provide us with a drive nowadays. Okay. Now, have you ever shot out in really cold temperatures or very hot temperatures? And oh, yeah. Had yeah. Guatemala was extremely, um, it was so hot. and But it was also like elevation. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, it's been a challenge. Um, and, you know, equipment performs differently in all kinds of weather you know the batteries die quicker in the cold etc cetera, etc cetera. uh the cameras heat up and the bodies expand and the sd cards have issue when it's too hot um the, I, we had a lot of problems with the sd cards freezing mm. even with the audio recorder and we love Tascam, but even sometimes in the moisture we have some issues um but you know overall i've worked with amazing people that that have cared a lot and they are prepared they've got double recordings going they're back into a hard drive before i'm off the set they've already backed it to a portable for me so you know been really blessed with the sound people that i've been working with recently okay now shifting gears to freelance i know you probably do some freelance tons so mm -hmm. do you have any freelance tips for our listeners when you're out there freelancing, you have to understand that you there's a sea of freelancers. And what's going to make you um, desirable, what's going to make them want to hire you again, going to what you just talked about, about forgetting things. And it's really buttoning all those things up and becoming extremely reliable. To a person that's paying you, they don't want excuses. There's tons of freelancers, but there's also tons of beginning freelancers. So what's going to make you stick out is that you cover, you dot all the I's, you cross all the T's as best you can. You are human. Um, the other tip is to really, really take stock of the competition and, and, and whatever you're best at really highlight that out there. And then, you know, don't just freelance. I mean, I'm now to, I freelance very specifically stuff. Like I want to do this very specifically, or if I'm going to freelance, I'm going to do this. And when I hire freelancers, I'm the same way. I'm very picky because there's just too many people out there trying you're looking for the guy that is great, you know, mm. To be pro at it, just master it. I'm all about master your craft. It'll make you desirable in the market. And it also allows you to charge a little more because they can rely on you. You know, they feel safer. So they're willing to pay maybe a premium to hire Michael the Sound Guy and Neil Galarte because we know those two guys are, you know, top-notch freelancers and they 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 are redundant and they feel safer. So they're willing to pay a little premium to, because they know you, you got to buy additional hard drives or you're going to do that level of backup for them. So that's my tip to freelancers is uh, don't count on somebody else to do your job. And then that makes you very uniquely positioned for when you got to work alone, but then it also makes you a killer teammate when you're on a team with other awesome people like yourself, that makes for a great set and a great experience and a great product uh, at the end of the day. Mm. I, it reminds me of a story when I was just starting out in the video business and, and doing audio. Somebody hired me to do audio for this big TV commercial project. And they said, all you have to do is show up. We'll, we'll have all the gear. I show up and they were like, well, we need this. And I was like, uh, I, I don't, I didn't bring any gear. And they were like, well, yeah, you told me you and they're like, well, you're the audio guy. And, and suddenly it got dumped all on me. And I was, you know, that was like a big lesson to learn. I think somebody had, we had to rush back. And we weren't that far from where we, you know, where, where my office was. So I was able to go get some, but I mean, how embarrassing and, and what a terrible position yeah. to be stuck in. So, but I've also met sound guys that, you know, they're kind of stuck in their way. So they're like, no, I'm only going to record on this recorder. I'm good. I got it. I'm good. And then I feel scared because I don't, I don't feel like, do they really got my back? I mean, I'll give you one fast story because I know we're, we're on timeline. We were uh, recording this new documentary we're doing now, and I went to record in Tampa, and I brought my trusty wireless, and I ran it to my trusty um, external recorder. About two or three minutes into the interview, I don't know, everything in my spider sense said you should be recording this some other kind of way. I didn't have another external recorder. I grabbed my laptop, which has logic on it. I, I just happened to have my interface because I was going to do a podcast the next morning somewhere else, a portable. I was, so I wasn't using this on the shoot. I ran to the car. 
grabbed my interface, ran the NTG4 boom mic to the interface, which went into Logic, recorded her as a live session, as if I was recording a podcast. It was a lot of setup, a lot of work. When I got home, thank God, thank God I did that extra step because the card, the card in the camera was going bad. And then when it came out, I'm sorry, not the camera, the, um, of the recorder, when it came out, a little piece of the plastic of the card actually broke off and I could no longer access that sound. Oh, wow. Had we not recorded it to the desk, to the computer, which by the way, sounded rad. Yeah. <laughs> That's an old word. Yeah. Um, it sounded so good, you know, cause with the computer, hello, you can put plugins live while you're recording. Mm. Right. Because you're going to a live channel right, right. in Logic. So thank God for that. And, but you know what? It was a no audio guy I know does that. Yeah. They just go to the external audio recorder and that's it. Or to the camera. I had a recent issue where I wasn't supposed to be doing audio and the audio coming into the camera, I was monitoring the camera, it was all distorted. I'm like, what yeah. is what is going on here? And we we tried. I had my I had my little Zoom H5 recorder in the car, and I hooked it all up, and everything was fine. So something, the audio interface that was hooked up to the camera, is going bad, and yeah. it's like. And then I I ended up recording to my Zoom and plugging in a, a line out right into the camera, and everything sounded great. But it was like that's that's so weird, and but stuff like that happens. Listen, man, being an audio producer, especially in the field, if you're an audio recordist. It's, it's like going on Survivor. You can't just go out there with just your knife, you know. And uh, people, they treat audio people, sadly, sometimes like they're the third option, third wheel, not as important. But man, let the audio not be great. And then they're coming down on them like they're the most important part of the vehicle. So I take a lot of time and I, and I annoy, I annoy, I annoy sometimes my clients. I take a lot of time to make sure our sound is as beautiful as our visual because I can't tell you how many projects I've worked on where the sound is the driver and the visual is the supporter. Yes, most of the time that's not always the case, but I'm a heavy sound design guy. I love sound to be as powerful. I want you to, as a podcaster and a filmmaker, I have a conundrum. I want you to close your eyes and this, whatever I made sound like an amazing podcast story as well. Like back in the radio days of Orson Welles. I want you to close your eyes and experience this project as if you could only hear it. So that that way, when I open the curtains and show you that it also has visuals, you're like, whoa, wow. But you, I always tell people, you should be able to strip your video entirely. And I still enjoy your story as a, you know, a recorded show. And people don't do that. They just, oh, it sounds different. Just strip the sound and you've got a show, whatever. But yeah, that's a good, it's not true. That's a good way to look at it. What common rookie problems do you see over and over again on set? Uh, wanting to use one mic for everything, right? Which I just told you I had to do. On a bu but that was strictly budgetary. If you have the toys, if you're a sound professional, you've got a lot of different microphones. You, you have, like you just said, you've got the, the tools and the blankets and you have all the inspector gadget toys, use them all. Like, you know, use what's necessary to achieve mastery. And rookie, I, I see it all the time. Oh, I have an H4 and I have this little wireless. Well, do you have another wireless in case that one goes out? No. Do you have a backup boom mic anywhere that's battery powered? No. Do you have, you know, an iRig on an iPhone so we could at least get something? No. Um, another big rookie mistake is, um, uh, I see this a lot, is people that end a shoot and don't repack all their gear properly or restore, recharge, you know, get your production bag that you're going to take for your next shoot. So then when you get that last second shoot, you just grab the bag and you run to the shoot thinking everything's there. And then you get there and they don't have the right XLRs. They don't have the right adapters. Adapters is another rookie thing. Like you just really opened up a, <laughs> I'll stop there. Uh, not having adapters, not having all the connectors, you know, a lot of rookie mistakes. The battery's not full and they don't have a way to charge it. Oh, does anybody have a charger? That's like, to me, the minute I hear a sound guy tell me that he's never getting hired again. Like show up with nine ways to save me. That's how I went back to what you said about what do I expect? Because you know, the sound guy is expecting, what's he expecting from me, the director? What's he expecting from me, the producer, right? He wants to get fed that day, get paid that day. Mm -hmm. So if you want to get paid that day, cover me, man. Mm -hmm. You know, like have every way. And as a good, as a good director, if I see you trying really hard, Michael, and, you, and, you've, and you're telling me, Neil, on, on set, I've tried everything I have in my arsenal and we just can't. Then I believe you and I defend you to the client. Otherwise, I go, I don't know, dude, the guy didn't try that hard. I'm so sorry. I lose the day and I take the hit in my budget. 
and I got to hire somebody else. Now it costs me double. Yeah. How have you seen the business change uh, since you started? Dude, <laughs> what business? It's not the same business anymore. You know, when I started, we had 30 pound cameras. On, I had a 30 pound pneumatic and a recorder on my left shoulder. You know, this was 1991. I've been around from big cameras down to mini DV, down to Sony Handycams, and then, you know, back up to XL1, Sony. I mean, if you remember all these cameras, yeah. uh, beta, you know, <laughs> um, and now I shoot a vlog with a GoPro session the size of a dice and have a sponsor that pays for that content. I now shoot, I just shot an, uh, an independent film on a handheld DSLR. Like the, it's not the same. I have a Blackmagic 4K. I have the bigger guns, but the business has changed because I just interviewed on All Things Post, my podcast, um, Luma Touch. They're going to eliminate the desktop. They, they want you to be a professional editor editing on an iOS device, native HD. They're already doing that. In five years, who's going to go back to the edit bay? They're just going to pay you to be at the hotel. So, and then the financial side of the business has changed. You know, they don't want a sound guy. As a matter of fact, since we're talking sound, what's the first thing that they always want to cut from my budget is sound and makeup. The things that I feel enhance, you know, <laughs> and what it does, it forces the camera now, the camera operator to now be a audio guy and just grab a zoomer of Tascam. And, you know, and everyone thinks because they have an external recorder that they have quality audio. No, you don't. You're just recording sound better than the mic on the camera is. What a sound guy brings is the knowledge of sound, of uh, knowing frequencies, understanding how to use certain mics together to cancel one, one of the other ones out. I mean, that's a mastery, like knowing how to use multiple mics to create an effect live that I want to maybe do later in post. I've had great audio guys like that, like, oh, I can achieve that. Let me just screw with these five mics and watch how I, get, I make it happen, you know, natively. So I have a great respect for sound guys. I just happen to be a one man band that's good enough to pull it off. But the minute I can afford a true audio guy, he he is high on my list, and 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 I want to I want to outsource that. You know. Now, if some of our listeners wanted to get into producing digital content, uh, what would you recommend they do? Okay, we just talked about one man band. Try not to be that. Try to find a band of brothers. And like you said earlier, hiring one another, feeding other people, right? You're never going to do all things great, you know? So um, getting into digital content creation is um, a, a passion. You, if you're not driven to do it every Friday, even when you don't have a good idea, your audience is waiting like this podcast. They're going to wait every Monday at X time. And uh, content creation is not a hobby, you know? It's it's a job. <laughs> it's work. Um and today we're in the age of the influencer. You know, my my sponsor, that's how they approached me. It wasn't you're a great content creator there. You have a level of influence and we want to attach ourselves to that. So your content has to influence something. Now, we're back in the day. You could just have a great YouTube channel with a lot of followers. So my advice to them is use social, use, you know, all your tools to to generate influence and then grow your influence and then now you can consider yourself a great content creator that influences people, not entertains only. Right. Yeah. You know? Well, Neil, as we kind of start to wrap things up here, do you have any final? What? We're not. <laughs> do you have any final <laughs> words of wisdom? Every time someone tells me do I have final words, I feel like <laughs> I'm dying, <laughs> or I'm never going to get invited back. What the hell? Um, Final words, man, is first, thank you for having me on your podcast. I, I'm super excited. Love seeing how our little journey has sort of keeps escalating. I'm starting to see you at all the big meetings. Like you're, you're, we have one chat and you're like so proving everything we talked about right. So congratulations on that. Um, you have my support and my podcast support. Um, final words is, listen, man, there's a million of you. And we live in a digital age where everybody has a phone. Everybody can record something. Doesn't mean it's the best quality. And you have to differentiate yourself as a sound person, whether you're a videographer. And the reason I say that, Mike, is because everybody there's a lot of one man bands. So even though I know we're talking about sound, let's be honest, the majority of people out there are doing both to some degree. Corporations are making producers now become great audio guys and animators because they can only afford one check. Right. So just to differentiate yourself, I want to repeat, just master your craft of audio, become a master at it. Don't just go out and rinse and repeat and you've got some great mics and buy the new toy once in a while. Buying a new toy doesn't mean anything. 
You, you know, know its pickup pattern, know what it means, know how to fight audio. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, the elements, you know, wind and sound and know how to help that director say, listen, I, I know you're having, I hear the problem. Let me see if I can use two other mics, if I can, maybe I can, you know, find a solution to force excellence. Then that's my final word. That's who I want to work with. That's the guy I want to pay at Guatemala when I don't know what I'm facing. And I know I got Mike, the sound guy with a, with he's like a ninja. He's got every kind of microphone in that backpack and he's going to do his best without me asking because he gives a crap about how it sounds because his name's going to be on that credit. That's my final word. Master audio. Don't just do it. As matter of fact, if you're going to do it, quit. Just stop right now so that the five guys trying to master it can get all the work because you don't deserve it. So my video, master it. Otherwise, we just got more, uh, you know, more crap. <laughs> YouTube has a million videos, but it has maybe 10,000 amazing ones. Exactly. Right. So that's the word from me. That's from the pulpit. Master your craft, man. Amazing. Um, amazing advice. Yeah. Now, if people wanted to connect with you or get in touch with you, how can they follow you? They're probably not going to want to now because I just yelled at them and told them to quit. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, listen, man, I'm all over Twitter at Neil Galarte, and it's N-I-E-L. You can look up Neil Galarte. Um, my podcast is All Things Post. I invite all of you to take a listen. And since your audience are creative professionals, I invite all of you to join our Facebook community. I'd love to have you guys. And then um, wildstylemedia.net is my company site where you guys can obviously, you know, learn about the production side of what I do. But I really am all over Facebook and Twitter. I'm happy to help anybody. Anyone has any questions, reach out to me, even though I told you to just quit. And, I, and I'll be here for you. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> and if you're doing some production in the Orlando area, look up Neil. And if even if, Absolutely. Even if if you're not in the Orlando area, look up Neil. So. Hey, if you master your craft and you live in Tennessee, but you want to work on something with me in North Dakota, send me your resume because I'm looking for the best for every project. And uh, it's, it's, you know, nowadays they make planes. We can all fly to one another. Exactly. So <laughs> Neil Gilliarte of Wild Style Media Group. Awesome. Thanks, man. No, thank you, man. Congratulations on your podcast. And uh, thanks for having me on. And a big thanks to all of our listeners out there. If you'd like us to discuss a particular topic, please send us an email at locationsoundpodcast at gmail.com. We would love for you to subscribe and leave us a comment. We're available on Apple Podcasts and iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, TuneIn Radio, and on your favorite podcast app. Until next time, remember, sound is half the picture. <laughs>